All right, you ready, Aaron? Yeah, I guess so. Can you all hear me? Yeah. All yeah. right. So, hi, I'm Aaron. I am a developer evangelist for a open source JavaScript framework called Loopback. How many people have heard of Loopback? Hey, that's a nice number of hands. Um, so, uh, if you see me on the internet, I usually look like a pink robot. Uh, that's my Twitter handle. You can get tweets about Loopback at Strong Loop. Um, my, my side project is a big online dictionary called WordNick, which also has an API. And I have made some static sites. I just wanted to like get into the spirit of the day. Um, some very stupid static sites. And I have some semicolon appreciation stickers on me, uh, semicolon appreciation society stickers on me, and I'm happy to give them out after the talk. So, um, <laughs> uh, so Loopback is a uh, framework for JavaScript, specifically for Node. How many people are Nodesters here? Yay! Um, and really, it's to help you rapidly generate APIs with Node. It's open source. It's maintained by IBM. IBM pays me, for which I am very grateful. Uh, it's based on Express. Are there lots of Express users here? Probably not if it's static site time, but you know, I like Express. Uh, Loopback is free to use. It costs no money to use. It's just basically npm install that thing, and you're ready to go. And you can deploy a Loopback application anywhere you can deploy a Node application. And the reason I love to use Loopback is because it makes writing API code fast. I like to call loopback cake mix for APIs. You basically add your data and you stir and you get a delicious set of APIs. And um, it's not, I mean, how many people like cake? Okay. How, of the people who like cake, how many people like baking cake as much as you like eating cake? Exactly. Like, I think more people like having and using APIs than like creating APIs. So that's why I really like loopback, because it gets you to the cake stage faster. Now, of course, it doesn't mean that you can't make a really fancy API cake with loopback. You can customize it you know, a million different ways, but the basic setup is there and is the same for everybody. So um, today I'm going to show you a semi-real world API that just shows you how fast that you can get up and running with loopback. So here's the project. Does everybody know these little stickers that you see on fruit and vegetables at the grocery store? Has anybody ever thought about these for like more than 10 seconds? Hey, that's excellent. So it turns out that these stickers and these codes are governed by the International Federation of Produce Standards, which is a body I never knew I wanted to join until I started thinking about these stickers. And so they have an open set of data that are just all of the codes and all of the fruits and vegetables to which they can be applied. And um, I actually found out about this data set through the absolutely wonderful um, data is plural tiny letter. So if you really like esoteric data sets, I highly recommend subscribing to this tiny letter because once a week you get all sorts of ridiculous data sets that are open. And this was one of them. Now they have a website. Um, and you can figure out what the codes are via their website. Sometimes. They have intermittent search issues. So sometimes you might have a code and not be able to look things up. But since you can export all of that code data, I was like, okay, well, why don't we make our own API for the fruit and vegetable stickers? Because the data, they, you can download a CSV file, but it's very easy to turn that data into JSON. And that's all you need to start making your own API. All you need to start making APIs with Loopback is a data set. So the database um, is Mongo, because why not? You know, <laughs> there are lots of reasons. You know, I, I feel like um, choosing a database is a very personal decision that should be between you and your doctor or your software architect. <laughs> um, but the great thing about using Mongo is that it's very well understood and supported, especially for Node, and the open source connector, the part that lets your Loopback app talk to your database, um, the Mongo connector is supported by the Loopback team at IBM. So it's, it's almost always completely up to date. So to get started, it's just like any other kind of Node application. You should have Node installed and NPM installed. You should have, for local development, you should have a local Mongo instance running. NPM install, loopback CLI, and then 
you answer a few simple questions. So let's brace ourselves and do a little bit of live coding. This is the part where I tell you that I have been fighting the cold for a week and I am on so much DayQuil. So they always say, don't operate heavy machinery, but I'm not sure if Node actually counts as heavy machinery. So I have already installed Node, MVM, and the Loopback CLI because nobody likes to watch people NPM install things. It's just super boring. Um, so to start a Loopback app, all I have to do is type LB app. And then you'll get your friendly Yeoman generator. Is that big enough? Should I make him a little bit bigger? Um, so let's call this application fruit numbers because why not? And it'll contain its own, it'll name it that directory. And uh, let's use the current version of loopback. And we're just going to make an empty loopback server. There are different kinds of loopback APIs that they give you um, kind of basic sets for. There's a hello world that's very simple. There's a notes that has a basic working example that uses files in memory. And then the API server also includes user authentication. but I'm, uh, user authentication loopback is really simple. It uses the passport module if you've used that before. But it's a little longer than we have time for today. So let's just make an empty server. So then we actually do have to watch NPM install for a little while. So luckily it's got lots of pretty colors. Um, and this being Google, do they have fiber to this building? I think they probably do. Um, so that's it. Now you have an application. And so we'll change, we'll change into the directory. And the three things that you need for a loopback application is this. And you need a model. And you need a data source. And we already decided that we're going to use Mongo as our data source. So to add that, let's just type loopback data source. And let's just call it Mongo. And then we can choose which connector. So Loopback supports a lot of different databases. Unsurprisingly, IBM's DB2 is one of them. Um, but <laughs> there's messaging, there's Redis, and we're going to choose Mongo. But I'll just scroll through so you can see that there's MySQL, obviously, Postgres, Oracle, um, different flavors of SQL. You can actually use your Loopback app to just proxy a different API or different REST call, SOAP. I've stayed so far away from this, I have no idea how the SOAP stuff works, but people ask about it, and yes, it's there. Couchbase, so all sorts of stuff. Elasticsearch, the Elasticsearch stuff is really great, actually, and I highly recommend playing with that. But let's go to Mongo, because we already made that decision. Um, so I'm just going to put in the string for the local connector. And this is a question I always ask. How many people use a clipboard manager? Not enough of you use clipboard managers. They will change your life, people. I am serious. Of the people who use clipboard managers, raise your hand if it changed your life. You don't have to just take my word for it. Think about having your whole copy-paste history, like just available to you for a long, long time. I use copy and paste. I'm very happy with it. There are tons and tons of them out there, free, paid. If you learn nothing else today, please. <laughs> clipboard manager. OK, rant over. So because I'm using a full string here with the URL and the name of the database, I can just skip the host, skip the port. Use This is all local, so I'm not going to have a user or a password. Skip the database. And now I'm going to install it. And we get to watch NPM a little bit more. So usually, I'm, uh, sometimes I will preload all this stuff, but I really wanted to see you know, nothing up my sleeves. This is all live. OK, so now we have loopback. Now we have a data source. Now we need a model. So I showed the, um, the JSON for the, the PLU data a little bit quickly. And we're just going to kind of uh, only use a few of the properties, because there's a lot of stuff in there, including um, both imperial and metric measurements, in case you need to measure your lemons in grams or ounces. But to just set up your model, LB model. And let's call um, this uh, model fruit number. And we already set up our data source, so we'll select Mongo. And we're going to call this a persisted model, because uh, even though we're probably going to only treat this data as read only, I like to leave the option that if, let's say, that 
they invented a new fruit that was like a cross between a grapefruit and a grape, which I don't know why they haven't done yet. If they added a new code, I'd like to be able to update my data. So let's call it to persisted model to be able to save it. And of course, I want to expose it via the REST API because otherwise, what is the point? Um, I don't need a custom plural form. Loopback has a pretty good um, method for adding regular plurals. And I'm going to use this as a common model instead of just server, because if I wanted to build a front end using this API, then any of my front end code could have access to this model as well. OK, let's add some properties. Um, let's give it a, uh, let's see if I can remember. Let's give it a plu. And that is a number. That's the actual number that's on the sticker. And let's make that required. And no default. And let's also give it a commodity, which is the name of the actual thing, apples or lemons or grapefruit or whatever. And that should be a string. And let's make that not required, because surprisingly, in the data, it is not required. Um, so you can have ghost numbers that are not attached to any fruit or vegetable. So it won't be required. No default. And then let's just use those two properties for now. OK, we actually now have an API. And I can show you. Let's go here. Let me make this bigger. So what has been generated for us off of that database and that model is this entire suite of CRUD APIs. That was it. That's all you needed to do. Even on cold medicine, you could do this. <laughs> so let's create one, right? So I happen to have a, in my clipboard manager, a large, <laughs> a large chunk of JSON. So this is the post. Let's try it out. Hopefully it will work. There's our response body, which means that it did actually work. We got a 200, posted to the database. But you know what good is a post without a get? So it automatically assigned an ID for me. That is just the default behavior right out of the box. But what I could do, and what is very simple to do, is I could decide that I wanted the PLU code itself to be the ID. So let's look at the code that gets generated. Let's make this really big we can. So here are our models. Actually, how do we make, I always forget how to make Sublime bigger. Um, yeah, plus didn't seem to do very much, but that could just be the, uh, there we go. Yeah, I have to actually be in a file. So here is the JSON that was created from the command line questions that I answered. So you can see here's the properties that we created, plu and commodity. And here is the default, which is ID injection true, which means it will create an ID property and it will uh, create that on a post or a put or a patch. And if you make this false, you can do this and say that this property is the ID. And then, um, we can go back here. Let's kill that and do it again. Obviously, if you were doing this for reals, you would want to have like nodemon and other real things. So now we've reloaded this. So now that I have um, asked for the plu to be the ID, we can look at the ID APIs. Figure, try to remember what that number was, 3,005. Let's see if that works. Oh, oh no, it's still running on the other one. Unknown fruit number ID. I might not have saved this. Or we can go back here. Right. 
You have to have something go wrong in live coding or nobody believes it's live. Okay. So I did. Well, we can just get all of the fruit numbers. Now we can see the one that we pasted before. We can get its ID if we want and go and get it by ID. And there we see it again. So again, very, very, very fast way to make a full set of APIs. And there are lots of cool things that you can do to extend um, your APIs with custom remote methods, basically, so custom endpoints. And that is all done in this JavaScript file that is created for you when you use the command line interface. And um, for example, if you wanted to be able to search all of your fruit number data by commodity, you could add an endpoint that just added a special filter to search all your data that way. And um, you can add pre and post commit hooks. So any you can have functions that fire before you save data. You can have functions that fire after you save data. You can have functions that fire before you read data. There, basically, you can load up this particular API cake with every flavor of sprinkles and frosting and gumdrops that you could possibly ever want to do. And the documentation is um, in-depth. There is a lot. And if there's anything that you can't figure out how to do, there's a very active Stack Overflow community, and there's a very active um, Google group, and a Getter page. Basically, and, and I believe, actually, I don't know if there's anybody left on IRC, but I bet the person who's left on IRC is super dedicated. <laughs> um, so essentially, that's it. That's, I mean, I'm going to have a couple more slides. But there are all sorts of other cool things you could do. You can actually even, um, this explorer kind of comes free with the API. Um, but you can add lines to that JS file to hide particular ones of these endpoints if you don't want them active. So let's say you want to make your API public, but you don't want to have any delete methods. Take them out. They don't have to be there. So let me go back to this real quick. So just a couple things to, sorry, I'm supposed to go from the current slide. Everybody wants to see more lemons though. Okay, so you could, I went through, you can use custom ID values, you can create remote methods, there are lots of hooks. You can add boot scripts. So when your application actually fires, uh, fires up, loads up for the first time, you can add logic there. Um, hiding endpoints and more. Um, and then, of course, once you have your API, you can build a front end, and you all know that already, so this is blank. I'm not going to build any front ends. Um, just want to talk a little bit about why I loop back as a framework, because obviously, you could build all of this yourself with just plain old regular vanilla JavaScript. And there have been some people lately who've said that you should build everything with vanilla JavaScript and not rely on frameworks like loopback and so forth. I really like frameworks for a bunch of reasons. I don't think it's bad to know how to build this stuff with vanilla JavaScript. Obviously, no one would say you shouldn't know how to do things. Um, but I think that frameworks, they make the implicit explicit. Because if you have a bunch of people using the same kind of structure to build the same kind of thing, everyone has different assumptions. But when you're sharing a framework across a bunch of people, you have to make those assumptions explicit because you can't rely on everybody understanding the code the same way that you understand the code. And I think that leads to making a shared mental model. Everybody who uses loopback eventually kind of converges on what's a data source. They have a shared idea of what a data source is. Everybody who uses loopback eventually ends up on a shared idea of, oh, what's a pre what's, you know, what are these hooks? Um, I think it also builds an ecosystem. I mean, I talked about how Stack Overflow is really active for loopback, about how there's an active Google group. If you have a lot of people who are all trying to solve the same problem with the same tool, there are other people that you can rely on. And maybe your own home rolled uh, system, depending on how big your team is, you might only have you know, four, five, 25 people who are all thinking about the problem with the same tool that you're using. I also think frameworks promote code reuse, which is great. 
because I like the wheels that we have now. I have no desire to invent any new ones. I just want to get where I'm going faster. And this is actually my favorite one. I think using a framework like Loopback or Express or any framework that you care to name, it allows you to learn from other people's mistakes. I don't have a computer science background. I'm an applied linguist, and I worked on dictionaries for over 20 years before coding full time. So whenever I can learn from things that other people have done wrong so that I don't have to do them wrong the first time I try them, that is a huge win for me. Because again, I want to get to where I'm going faster. And again, um, every time I give a demo, I always ask, if you see something that I did you know, wrong for some value of wrong, or if you just think I could be doing it better, please let me know. Because I love to learn how to do things better and faster. Um, and again, frameworks, they help you build. So if someone tells you, oh, well, you know, if you were a real developer, you'd do X. I think you can always come back to them and say that a real developer is someone who builds safe, stable, and maintainable applications that users want and need. This is what I think the value of real is. So there are plenty of loopback resources. Loopback.io is where all the documentation is. I mentioned the Google Group Stack Overflow tag. There is an IBM developer work site. It's a little bit churny right now, but there's still lots of great demos there. Um, once you have your API, I'm contractually obligated to tell you that you can host it on IBM. Um, <laughs> Bluemix. And if you need to manage an API, actually API Connect is awesome for this. If you need to set rate limits, if you need to have a design tool, if you uh, need a developer toolkit and a portal and all that good sugar candy stuff, API Connect, you should give it a shot. Um, pretty soon they'll be, in fact, probably now, I'm not sure if it's production yet, but there's a Dockerized version of API Connect, so you can run it on IBM's Bluemix, so you can run it anywhere. Your container can run, and there's plenty of data available about API Connect. And uh, it actually, uh, API Connect is free for the first 50,000 calls, um, the essentials tier. So you've got a lot of headroom to play with it if you want to. So um, again, here's where you can find me on the Twitters. And this whole repo is available in the Strong Loop Evangelist GitHub repo. And it actually has a little bit more. It has um, custom methods. And um, uh, it also has, um, shows you how to delete endpoints and more stuff like that. So the repo is a little bit more fuller fleshed out than this. And I know they said no questions, but we have a little bit of time because I usually think people have questions. What do you think? Well. If you're gonna corner me, it's the only no, no. Talk, we do, right? we so do, yeah. Like <laughs> we do actually have a few minutes. It's okay, you can laugh. I <laughs> see you guys <laughs> like, oh god, this chick. Uh, do you have any questions? You can always come and find me after to get your semicolon appreciation sticker. See, what's happening yeah. here is they're in the mentality that they shouldn't have prepared any questions in their minds because I told them they couldn't have the opportunity to ask them. <laughs> so they've already well, eliminated now, that now option. I get the best of both worlds. I feel, you know, I look like a very like open person, ask me anything, but you've already set them up to not ask anything. Yeah, yeah, zero yeah. expectations. Oh, I stalled long <laughs> enough to <laughs> give you time here. I'll ask a question. How did you come up with the name Loopback? I have no idea. That's an excellent question. The question is, how did they come up with the name Loopback? So the loopback, loopback framework was created by the people on the Strong Loop team, and Strong Loop got acquired by IBM about a little less than two years ago. And so I just joined last fall. And I, I've tried to ask them where Loopback came from, but they're so busy actually working on it that they have no time for questions like this. <laughs> so <laughs> they just kind of like, they're like, look at the GitHub history. So. <laughs> Anybody else have a non-onomastic question? Oh. <laughs> oh, oh, sorry. It's just like two more, so I got excited. One, two. Is there a way to import the data model differently by than just defining it uh, yes. by hand? Yes. Um, if, if you want to define your data model um, not in a series of questions and answers asked by the Yeoman generator, which I totally sympathize with, you can just paste it in to this JSON file. As long as it's valid JSON, basically everything in the properties um, block, you can just type in by hand. And that's, that's very convenient. Um, and I should also uh, mention that um, 
Loopback lets you export an open API spec specification, which is hard to say. You know the spec formerly known as Swagger? So it's completely OAI compliant and you can export a swag, uh, open API spec from it. So, and if you have an open API spec, you can import it and create your APIs from that. So. Uh, did, did you have any examples of people using this uh, in production? Yes, there are people using it in production. We're still trying to, because IBM, get permission to say which people, <laughs> which very large corporations are using it. Um, but if you, um, if you just kind of snoop around a little bit on the profiles of the people asking the Stack Overflow questions, it's pretty easy to see which of those giant corporations are using Leapback. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Stalker tips from Aaron. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> What, uh, what license was it under? Oh, that is a good question. It is a very permissive license. Um, and you can find it, let's see if we can actually just look at it. I want to say MIT, but let's, yes, MIT. Any um, other questions? Oh, oh, you're back there. Nope, uh, nope, mm -mm. nope, we're going to do this on the mic. We're going to do it on the mic, but we're going to reach. Aaron, I know that you said that you can't name who's uh, working on it, but I was wondering if you could give uh, some sense Those of. Uh, I, I was wondering if you could give us some sense of how companies uh, use this in production. So, usually, what I've seen happen, and again, I should let you know I've only been working on with this since this past October, is that the path seems to be, an individual developer sees loop back and says let's use this for prototyping because it's so darn fast. And then it just works. And unlike other prototypes that make it into production, uh, it's not as terrifying because there's a lot of support behind it and it's really well fleshed out and it's very extensible. So what happens is usually a developer will get permission to use it as a prototype and then it just lives forever, which is great. Um, and also I think it's, um, I use it personally for Wernick as a side project and it's great especially for cases where you have a really well understood data model you might have an older monolithic application that you want to split out into say something more microservicey and you just want to pull out a little bit of it at a time and so you could you could point loop back at your database generate your APIs and be off to the races so that's usually how I see it it working so that's how it's worked for me <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Erin. Right. Thanks so much for your kind attention.